All right. Hello to everyone. I'm hoping this is working. I think it is. Yep. There we go. Good stuff. So, welcome to the very first, uh, the first during the agenda session of uh, of Dev Days. Thank you guys all for uh, for coming and joining us for uh, for this session, which is of course, let's build uh, the Happy Fire Edition. Um, this uh, this session, I mean, lots to say here. Um, there is a link to the slide deck that we're uh, we're presenting. It's up on the screen. Uh, I will be sharing it again in a little bit, uh, so don't worry if you uh, if you don't if you're not grabbing it right now. But feel free to uh, to take a screenshot of the screen right now if you'd like. If you want to grab a uh, grab a copy of that, um, it will be useful later. There is sort of an exercise. We're not going to uh, not going to have time to do it together, but. Um, we will, of course, have uh, you will have the opportunity to to work on it uh, afterwards. And if you want to ask questions or whatever, we will have, of course, the open the office hours, whatever they're calling at this time, the the pub talk or whatever. Uh, so there'll be lots of chance for doing that. Um, as I say, welcome to everyone wherever you are in the world. Um, I am uh, I am joining you guys from uh, from sunny Canada. It's uh, it's a beautiful day out right now and. I've got the added bonus that I literally just got a call that I'm, uh, I'm now eligible for my second vaccine dose. So I'm having a good day. Uh, looking forward to Dev Days. What a lot of good stuff on the agenda. I think this is gonna be a good time. So uh, with that out of the way, let's get into this. I will start by saying just like pretty much every presentation you'll ever see on Happy Fire and certainly most of the presentations that you'll ever see on Fire uh, as a general topic, uh, this presentation is, is, is open licensed. We, uh, we license this under the Creative Commons license. Um, we're gonna so, show you some code samples today. Those are all, uh, those are all licensed in, uh, under the Apache 2 license. So please feel absolutely free to share this with your friends, uh, anyone who couldn't be here today or whatever. Um, we absolutely encourage that. As I say, you've got a link to the slides. You're welcome to share that link with anyone you'd like. Uh, we really do uh, do encourage people to, to distribute this content because, of course, knowledge is uh, is a wonderful thing. So, who is uh, who's joining you today? Um, as I say, I'm uh, I'm joining you from Canada. It's uh, it's a, in, here in Toronto. It's uh, it's early afternoon. So, good afternoon to anyone on the East Coast. Good uh, good morning to anyone on the West Coast. Uh, I'm joined by Patrick Werner, and hopefully Patrick will tell us what time it is where he is. Patrick. Yeah, hi everyone. Good evening from Germany. Um, it's 7 p.m. right now here in Mannheim. <laughs> Great to be here too. So thanks for, for having me and for doing this workshop together or this hands-on training together for the second time already. Fantastic. Yeah, and I'm glad uh, glad Patrick raises raises that. Uh, I will mention this is our second time uh, doing this uh, doing this sort of joint session together. We did this for the uh, the virtual Dev Days Europe back in November, uh, and it went quite well, I think. So we're hoping it will be uh, will be similar this time as well. So uh, in terms of what we're doing, um, the the Let's Build, of course, is it takes up two blocks of the session. Um, there is, there is a, so of course, Dev Days is organized into 45 minute blocks uh, with 15 minutes between sessions. Uh, because our two sessions are back to back, we've got the full hour. We are going to try and keep the talking to 45 minutes anyway, um, so that if anyone wants to watch both and they need 15 minutes to check emails or use the bathroom or want to stick around and ask questions, uh, any of that is welcomed. We will stick around uh, to add, answer any questions that might happen at the end. Um, the session is divided into two hours. Uh, the first, we are going to be starting with an introduction just to Happy in general, um, going through some some sort of stuff around how to get a get a project going, how to uh, how to to use the model, how to use the parser. Uh, and then we're going to tie this into a real world exercise. And of course, the exercise, um, if we had more time between the sessions, you'd have a bit more time to actually try the exercise. And unfortunately, you'll probably have to wait until after Dev Days or tonight or something if you want to give it a shot. But if you're new to Happy Fire, I highly encourage to give it a shot. We will be around for the rest of the conference. And of course, we're always happy to answer questions on uh, on well, on the exercise or on anything else to do with with Happy Fire, we've tried to come up with sort of a real world use case that uh, guides the exercise, and I'll tell you about that when we get there. But we're going to go through that. Uh, that's hour one, and then hour two, uh, Patrick is going to take us through how to actually use the Happy Fire client to interact with a server, how to send data um, from your from your local uh, laptop up onto a server. 
The last time we did this, there were we actually had three hours. Um, this time we only have two, so we've decided we would leave the third hour in. Um, we've left it as bonus material. We won't be uh, won't of course have time to present that material to you, but you will notice uh, in the slide deck if you uh, if you go to check it out, you'll notice that there is a third hour listed in there. So that's uh, that's what that's all about. Um, you will also notice uh, in the code snippets a few in a few places. I was noticing right before this uh, it refers to day one and day two instead of hour one and hour two. That's only because the hours were on separate days the uh, the first time we presented this. So that's sorry for that, but ah well, that's why that looks like that. So diving into happy fire. Um, Happy, I will start by saying, Happy is a pretty old open source community. Um, as far as open source healthcare uh, systems go, certainly we're not the biggest or the oldest. I think both of those honors go to the Vista, the Vista EMR produced by the US Veterans Administration. Um, but I have no numbers really to back it up, but I think we're number two, perhaps. Uh, we've been around for ages, at least as far as active open source health healthcare projects go. Um, Happy started its life in 2001 as an HL7 version 2 parsing library. Uh, it, was, it was written just to support a little web portal back in the days when web portals were, uh, were even a new concept. Uh, has been super successful over the years doing that. Uh, Happy's original HL7 v2 library is I don't want to say dormant, but it actually doesn't receive a whole lot of programming anymore. Uh, not because uh, it's got it's stagnant, really, but more because it's it's effectively finished. We occasionally fix bugs when people report them, but it supports uh, all the major releases of the HL7 v2 standard uh, and is fairly complete. So there's not a whole lot left to do on that project. So uh, it just carries on as it needs to. Um, Happy Fire was started in, well, roughly, I guess, uh, you would have even seen if you watched the video in the uh, in the opening talk for Dev Days. Uh, Happy's first release, the 0 0.1 release, was in 2014. Uh, we started programming it in 2013. So Happy Fire itself now is eight-ish years old uh, as a project, which I don't know, in some ways makes it seem like a baby, but in some ways makes it seem absolutely ancient. I guess if you compare it to something like Firefox or Linux, it's just a baby, but compare it to your average JavaScript library and uh, I think Happy is like an old man. So there we go. Um, it's uh, It's been around for a while. Uh, the two Happy projects are sister projects. They are not uh, a single code base, nor do they share a single code repository. Uh, certainly you can use both of them in, in the same project. We've seen lots of people write applications that support both HL7 v2 and Fire. Uh, and you can use them together, but they are separate code bases. And while they do some things in similar ways, they, they even sort of differ in their approach a little bit. We've tried to learn from the, the, the successes and the mistakes of the first library with the second one. So things will work a little bit differently in, in that library. This map, which I just, I, I, I can never do a talk and not uh, not show it off at least once. Uh, this is a map of, uh, of Google Analytics against the Happy Fire developer documentation. And I always think it's it's kind of a nice snapshot for, I mean, partly for, for where Happy is being used, but really I think more generally, it's a good snapshot of where the Fire standard is being used. Um, in the early days, like even, even three years ago, uh, you wouldn't have seen nearly the bubbles in, in many parts of the world, South America, for example, East Asia. Um, you know, it was much more heavily focused on North America and Europe. So it's been fun watching the rest of the world come online with Happy Fire. Uh, and in fact, this map is, uh, I think this is a, a grab that I took about a year ago. Um, the latest versions of this are starting to see activity in Africa even. So we're even starting to round out uh, the last major continent that didn't see a whole lot of action for Happy Fire. So I think that's exciting. Uh, it is truly a, a very global community, which is is very cool. Um, there we go. Happy Fire, um, one thing that I always need to stress, uh, because this does confuse people when they get started with the library. Um, the version numbers for Happy uh, are completely independent of the version numbers for Fire itself. Uh, and different releases of the, the Happy Fire library support multiple versions of the Fire standard. Uh, if you are developing an active production project today, you're probably using Fire R4, which is, of course, the, the current major release of, uh, like the current uh, GA release of Fire. Um, that has been supported really from Happy Fire 3.7. Um, and uh, there are, I'm not showing every version here on the left, we're up to 5.4 now. 
uh, and 5.4 continues to support Fire R4. But worth mentioning, um, Fire R5 is coming eventually. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have to add the uh, the crazy R4B release as well into this list. Um, it's, that's uh, that's going to be added into Happy before too long as well. Uh, also worth pointing out while I'm on this slide, we I mean we really rarely drop versions of Fire. Uh, in fact, we may never drop a version of Fire again. We did drop Fire DST1 way back. Uh, this was about uh, two-ish years ago um, when we released Happy Fire 3. Maybe it was three years ago, either way. Um, we, we did that after a fairly extensive community consultation where it turned out that almost nobody was still using DST1, so we felt safe in dropping it. Um, this, this sometimes stresses people out because we know there are lots of people with production code running Fire DST2. And of course, that's the, the first release after the last one we dropped. So sometimes people get a little bit nervous about that. Uh, I will say we have no plans to drop support for DST2 now or really anytime in the future. I guess I, I do assume at some point in the distant future we will drop it, but uh, the only time we will drop it is after we've done yet another community consultation and it turns out nobody's using it anymore. And uh, who knows, I, I don't like to speculate how long that's going to take, but I'm, I, I don't know, I'd say minimum five years uh, until really the DSTU2 go, code goes away because it really has been adopted pretty widely in production systems, which is great on, on its own. So we'll just be adding to the list of, of versions of Fire that we support as we go. So a, a real whirlwind tour of what's in the Happy Fire library. I'll do that now. Uh, this diagram sort of shows off all of the major components of Happy Fire. Uh, and we're really, I mean, we've only got two hours together today, so we don't have time nearly to talk about all of these components. So I wanna give you a sense of all of the things that Happy Fire does. Uh, I'm also gonna walk you through the, the website in a little bit. Main point being, uh, you may well, you know, if there's if there's stuff here that you're interested in, uh, it is all extensively documented on on our website. So while I may not be able to show you all of this stuff, uh, we'll certainly be able to to point you in the direction where you can learn about it. Uh, up on the top left, we've got um, a complete set of model classes that represent all of the different um, fire resource types, all of the different data types, and all of the structures that exist within the fire standard. We have got separate model classes for every release of fire as well. So there is a patient Java class, for example. Uh, patient, of course, is like the, the hello world of fire resources. Uh, we've got a patient.java, and in fact, there are four or five of them, um, one for each of the major releases of Fire. So while there are subtle uh, subtle differences and resources iterate over time, we have created versions of all of those model classes across all of those things. We've also got a, uh, a parser and a serializer, or some, some people like to call these marshallers and unmarshallers. Uh, those, of course, are used to translate your your, your Java objects into the serialized form, either XML or JSON. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, fairly recently, we added support as well for the RDF turtle format. So I should probably update this slide. Uh, all three of the major formats for Fire are supported by Happy Fire, uh, JSON, XML. Uh, interestingly, anyone who's watching the, the Zulip uh, you know, chat.fire.org platform. Uh, and if you don't know about that, I'll talk about it a little bit later. But anyone who's watching the social stream of, of chat.fire.org would have possibly noticed uh, a great big discussion on, on the, the popularity of the various formats. Um, we, within the, we have an open source uh, and, a, and a public Happy Fire server, of course. And that server in some ways is like a little ballot box where people can vote on their favorite encoding because of course, when you use the server, you have to pick an encoding you want to use. Uh, the numbers there, if anyone is curious, JSON is absolutely crushing the competition of XML and Turtle. Um, it, it's, it's by a factor of well over 10 to one that people request JSON, which it's, it's in fact, it's way more than, than 10 to one. So it's kind of comical how much more popular JSON is to the other, uh, the other versions, uh, the other pro, uh, encodings. Uh, I don't think, I don't know, that probably shouldn't surprise anyone. I, I have a soft spot for XML, but if I'm honest, I vastly prefer JSON myself. And I suspect everyone who's listening, uh, well, probably not everyone, but I bet many of you guys agree. Uh, the stuff that I'm going to talk about in the first hour is, are these two boxes on the top. 
um, that's going to be our main focus uh, today. Uh, Patrick is going to then get into, in the second hour, the client framework. And the client framework is something you can use to write applications that interact with servers. No surprise there. Uh, I'll leave it to Patrick to, uh, to elaborate on that when we get there. I will mention there is an Android client framework that extends the regular client framework. It actually, uh, among other things, it drops support for XML just to keep the size down um, and has a couple of specializations so that it can boot faster on, on Android, but there we go. Uh, more importantly, there are two server frameworks that are a part of Happy Fire. Um, we are not going to have, unfortunately, time to get into them today. And often, if we, you know, if we had a third hour, that would be exactly what we would cover. Uh, don't stress, though, if you're interested in servers and you're sad that we're not going to talk about them today, uh, there is loads of material on the website. And when I get to showing you the website, I'll show you where you can uh, where you can download a. Uh, a starter project for either of these frameworks as well. Uh, the server framework, often called the plain server framework, this, this first one, is effectively a, a facade layer over an existing, an existing set of data structures. Um, the idea here is if, let's say you've got an existing application, that application has its own data model, it's probably got its own database or whatever, uh, and you want to add Fire to it without having to re redesign the entire application to be a Fire native application. Uh, never fear, uh, the Happy Fire server framework is well designed to sit on top of your application. Uh, it is a Java application, of course, so you've got you to code everything up in Java. But the rest of your application can or cannot be, be Java. We have certainly seen people with, with other platforms uh, use Happy Fire's plain server to add Java Java-based fire capabilities without even reworking the rest of uh, the rest of what they're doing. So that's a that's a useful thing if you need a facade on top of it. Uh, we've also got this this framework we call the JPA server framework. Um, Longtime Java programmers will recognize the term JPA uh, as the Java persistence architecture. Um, really, when we say that, we basically mean the Hibernate library, which is a uh, an object relational map, mapper, mapper, an ORM uh, library. Um, at its core, Happy Fire JPA uses those technologies, and that's why it's called that. Happy Fire JPA is a complete sort of Fire server in a box. It's an open source, uh, complete Fire server. It includes its own storage model, uh, its own table structures. It'll sit on top of any relational database uh, that Hibernate supports, certainly including all the popular ones, um, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, uh, and plenty of others as well. Uh, we've seen people take advantage of, uh, of those capabilities on quite a few different databases, actually. Um, it, uh, so the, the JPA server, also worth mentioning, uh, it does support all of the obvious stuff. Uh, it supports all of the fire resource types, uh, all of the, the CRUD operations, and then some. But it's got all kinds of other capabilities as well. So it's got support for things like fire subscriptions, which is this really interesting pub sub mechanism defined in the fire spec. It's got support for documents. It's got support for validation. Um, what else is in there? It's got a million configuration options so that you can specify how big a payload you get and what search parameters to support and all those all those different things. So it is at this point a very well fleshed out uh, piece of uh, piece of software. Uh, anyone who's ever used our public testing server, which lives at happy.fire.org. Uh, that public testing server is, in fact, running the Happy Fire JPA server. So if you, uh, if you want to host your own version of that, you can. Uh, worth mentioning as well, uh, the, the Happy Fire JPA server, I mean, it started its life uh, a long time ago as just a proof, of, uh, a proof of concept. When we initially wrote it, we really only intended it to be a demonstration of what a Fire server could look like. We didn't actually consider it to be production-ready code. Uh, that opinion has long since shifted. Um, we, I mean, we ourselves started using it for a couple of production purposes. We started hearing other people were. We decided to get really serious about it um, and ended up turning it into, I would say, a fully production-ready solution. So if you're wondering, can the Happy Fire JPA server be a backend, or really any of the rest of the, the framework, any of these modules, if you're wondering, can I bring these to production, well, certainly you can. Um, you've got lots and lots of examples of that um, including anything from little you know little tiny startups writing a uh, an app in their basement all the way up to great big multinational vendors um, who are baking happy fire into the core of things that they're building um so i guess the uh the answer to that is yes you absolutely can 
Uh, a couple of other things worth mentioning. We do, of course, have validation in the uh, in the library as well. So resource validation. Uh, we're not going to talk about it much today, but if you are implementing fire applications, um, these days, there's a good chance you're probably implementing against an implementation guide, an IG. Uh, and if you're doing that, we absolutely have support for validating your resources against those IGs, uh, as well as importing those IGs and all that good stuff. Uh, we've got a narrative generator module, which can be used to generate um, what Fire calls uh, narrative template or narratives. Uh, these are little HTML snippets that describe what's in the resource. We've got a module called the web test page overlay. Um, which I've, I've always hated that name and I wish we'd named it something better, but oh well. Uh, the web test page overlay, uh, you'll, you'll know it perhaps as the, the UI that lives at happy.fire.org. If you want that UI and perhaps you want to customize that UI for your own application, you can do, it, do exactly that with the test page overlay. And then we've got the Happy Fire CLI, which is a, a command line tool that has a bunch of, uh, a bunch of little toolbox functions related to, to Happy Fire in it. So I'm um, looking at some code. I'm going to go through a few snippets just to give you a sense of how the Happy Fire library works before we shift into, uh, into the end of the exercise portion of today. So this example, of course, is showing you how to create a patient. Um, and of course, like anything in Java, the first thing you want to do when you're creating something is call its constructor use the new keyword and of course patient.java exists. If you're creating an observation, you're gonna say new observation, so on and so forth. Uh, all of the resource types are named after, uh, or all of the, the Java models are named after, of course, their, uh, their internal resource types. Um, on my example here, what I'm doing is I'm adding a name to that patient and you can kind of see what I'm doing there. I'm adding an identifier. Uh, and I'll point out here that the model sort of uses this, this you know, what's often called a fluent design. Uh, and fluent design basically means that it's designed to sort of chain things together naturally. Um, this, this chaining, I mean, it's a little bit jarring perhaps when you first come to use Happy Fire, but almost everyone um, who, who starts with the library ends up loving it just because it ends up, it ends up being this really nice expressive way of writing Java. It plays really well with IDEs just because you can always use IntelliSense, you know, the, the code completion features of whatever IDE you're using to, to really quickly chain through and, and set up your resources. Uh, you'll notice that I, I call add name to add a human name data type to my patient. And then on that name object, I can call set family and then uh, add given and add given. <clears throat> this is perhaps not obvious why this is set and this is add. That's because uh, given is a repeatable field and family is not. So there's a little bit of semantics of the fire standard even built into these fluent calls. Um, the whole thing ends up playing really well together. So that uh, that ends up being something that I think people tend to really appreciate when they when they get started with the fire standard. Uh, I do, uh, you know, I always stress um, the, the best thing you can possibly do um, when you're using Happy Fire is get uh, get the library into an IDE. Make sure that the source jars are also uh, available to your IDE because the intelligent uh, code completion is a really, uh, it's frankly kind of a magical part of the Happy Fire experience. If uh, it's probably a little bit too dramatic sounding, but um, really what I mean by that is all of the Fire documentation itself, we have imported into the Java docs of, of our data models. So, you know, if you bring up um, the, I don't know, you bring up the, the patient resource and you're going through and you're wondering uh, what's the telecom element about if you hit control space or whatever the binding is in your uh, your platform of choice, uh, up will come the list of attributes. If you pick telecom, the Java docs that should show up automatically in there will include a description of what that, uh, that element is about, uh, including all of the same information that you would get on the Fire spec itself. So that winds up being, uh, being really quite useful as you're trying to, to get started with the library. Uh, the Fire spec defines a number of elements that are coded, um, you know, that are required to use a specific code that comes from a code system defined in Fire. Uh, if these are terms that are new to you, uh, you're probably brand new to Fire and don't stress, uh, it's not actually that bad a concept. Uh, the simplest explanation, of course, is picture, picture the gender attribute on the patient. Um, Fire has defined for its purposes four codes for uh, for gender. Those are male, female, other, and unknown. 
Um, and those codes, if you're creating a fire resource and you're including the gender attribute, you are required to use those four codes. Uh, the, the gender attribute in fire has what's called a required binding. Uh, and a required binding, uh, I mean, it's, there's a lot, of, a lot of information packed into that term, but for our purposes here, let's just say it means that you've got to use one of fire's four codes. So for anything in the fire spec that uses one of these required bindings, we include a Java enum. Uh, and you'll notice in my code snippet here that on patient uh, in patient's gender, uh, I'm using one of these enums. You'll find them sort of littered throughout the spec. Here I am in the telecom. This is a, that uses a data data type called contact point. Uh, contact points are for things like phone numbers and email addresses and fax numbers and all those uh, all those good things. Um, there are enums that sit in there. So for any of these things, we have enums. We often get questions. From people who are wondering, uh, you know, I see the gender has an enum, but why doesn't this other field that's also coded in the fire spec have an enum as well? Uh, and if you run into that question, and you probably will when you get started with, with Happy Fire, the answer is always because that field doesn't have a required binding. Uh, there's many places in the spec where you're allowed to use your own codes on top of the ones that are supplied by fire. Gender is not like that. You have to use fire's codes for gender, but uh, there's lots of other spots you can use your own codes. And of course, we can't use any num for that because uh, enums in Java are not extendable. You can't add values to them or subclass them or anything like that. So enums were just not a good fit for, uh, for a lot of coded attributes within the standard. But they were a good fit for these, uh, these ones I've got on the screen. So you will find that we have enumerated types there. Um, the fire standard also defines a set of data types. And I always, uh, I always struggle with this because there's a lot of information to get through with data types. But let's just say that Fire, you know, just like any programming language you've ever used, of course, has all of the basic primitive data types you'd expect, uh, and then some actually. So there's Boolean and decimal and date times and all of that good stuff. Um, because Fire is a, a, st a data standard and not a programming language, its data, data type set is actually a fair bit richer as well than, uh, than most programming languages. So there are some fairly esoteric uh, data types as well. Things like URI gets its own data type. Uh, markdown text gets its own data type. So those are two examples that you probably wouldn't find in a programming language, but you certainly do in, uh, in Fire. For any of these primitive data types, we have included a Java class that wraps them. So the date time class, um, we take the name of the data type and we add the word type to the end just to distinguish these from other structures in the standard. So the date time data type uh, is called date time type, of course, and the Boolean data type is called Boolean type. Um, what these things are internally are really just wrappers for generally speaking, an equivalent uh, Java primitive of some sort. So the decimal type, which is for decimal numbers, of course, as you can see, is in, internally it's using a, uh, a Java double. Um, for the most part, we wrap these, but it is worth mentioning, people often wonder, why do you have these wrappers for, for Boolean? Like, what's the value in wrapping a, a primitive Boolean in this, this clunky Boolean type? Um, there's two reasons we do this. Uh, the first is that uh, the first is that we can you can add extensions almost anywhere in the fire spec. Uh, I, I'm not showing it here, and this is certainly a a part of the standard that is a little bit more advanced than we're going to get into today. But it is worth mentioning. Fire has this amazing extension capability, and you can put extensions all over the standards, certainly including on primitive types. So you might interact with one of these these wrapper classes if you wanted to add an extension to a primitive value. That's one of the reasons you do that. The other is that we store a string representation and there are places where that comes in really handy beyond just the primitive data. One example where that can be useful is with decimal numbers where you want to store precision. Of course, in Java, if you've got 1.2D, uh, you can add as many zeros after that two as you want. Java will just ignore those. Like Java doesn't store any concept of this is how precise that number was. Uh, but Fire, Fire does have that concept. In, in Fire, of course, we're representing medical data. And oftentimes in medical data, precision is important. So trailing zeros are absolutely preserved. And if you want to interact with this number as a string so that you can be sure to preserve those, then you do have that capability within uh, 
by by interacting with the string representation of whatever your data type is. So those are those are the main reasons we've got these these funny type types that uh, that wrap primitive Java concepts. I will say you often don't need to interact with the the the, the data types that that come with Happy Fire. Um, for example, observation has an element called comment, which is a a fire string type. And you don't even need to worry about the string type. You can just say observation .set comment and pass a comment in. Or if you want, this is the, there's always a version that takes in the, the, the fire wrapper equivalent set comment element. Pulling data out of resources, much the same. You pull those out by, uh, by calling either get comment, which gives you the raw string, or get comment element, which gives you the, the, the wrapper class. And if you were interested in extensions or precision or something like that, you would want this second form to get that data out. Once we get into uh, into the next section, we're going to talk a little bit about the Happy Fire context. Um, everything in Happy Fire comes from this Fire context object. Uh, it's pretty much the starting point for any of the utilities in the Happy Fire uh, the Happy Fire world. Um, you can use context to ask ask for parsers, for serializers, for validators, for um, what we call tersers, for fire path implementations. Uh, there's all this good stuff in there. Uh, and I mention this mostly because I want to stress one, one really important pattern. And that's all I'm going to say about fire context because I know Patrick's going to talk, talk more about it when we get to uh, the second hour. But I do want to stress, if you're writing your own application using Happy Fire, one of the most important things to do is make sure that you create a single fire context and reuse it as much as you can around your library. Don't. Uh, the biggest anti-pattern is every time you need a new parser, you create a new fire context. That invariably will be slow because the fire context is a heavyweight object. Uh, it's intended to be used once and kept around. It is really, really fast once it's once it's been created. Uh, it, it can be it's multi-thread it's multi-threadable, like it's it's thread safe. Uh, it doesn't leak memory or any of those things, so you can absolutely reuse it as much as you want. You can even put it into a static variable safely. Uh, just don't constantly create them because you'll end up with uh, much worse performance than you would otherwise. Quickly talking about parsers and serializers. This is an example of, of how the parser and the serializer work. So in my simple example up on the screen, I'm creating a patient resource. Uh, I am giving it some properties. So I'm almost always when I'm doing uh, test data, I always use Simpsons characters. So here I am creating Homer J. Simpson. Oops. Uh, giving him a telecom and a gender and an identifier of some sort. And then most importantly, if I want to parse, uh, in fact, what I want to do is serialize, uh, I am going to create a new fire context. Uh, and when you create a fire context, you create it for the version of fire that you're dealing with. So this is clearly a, uh, an example using uh, a previous release of fire. I then ask my context for a parser. Uh, and in this case, I'm asking it for a JSON parser. The parser has all kinds of options I can set. Uh, and the one that I almost always do when I'm writing demo code is I will configure that parser to do pretty printing, which of course means you know, format everything nicely on new lines with indentation and all of that stuff. Obviously a super useful thing to do when you're troubleshooting, but in a production system, kind of a nice thing to turn off because you'll, uh, you'll save bytes over the wire. Worth pointing out, uh, in some frameworks, you'll have these dual objects called your parser and your serializer, or a pair of objects called your marshaller and your unmarshaller. In Happy Fire, both of those functions are, are performed by a single object called the parser, which I, I, I didn't even think about this when we created the library, but it, it has turned out to confuse some people uh, when they get started with Happy Fire. You use the parser for serialization as well as parsing, uh, which I mean, even saying it, I, I now realize why it's confusing, but that decision was made long ago and it's definitely too late to really worry about. So just so you realize uh, that the iParser interface is used for both parsing and serializing. On our parser object, we're calling this method called encode resource to string. Um, and of course, that gives us a string representation of the, the, the fire resource that we created up here. So what does this look like? When we actually run this, this is the output we get. And as you can see, we've got a nicely formatted fire resource in exactly the way that the fire spec wants it to look. Parsing works pretty much the exact same way. Um, this example is showing you how to parse a resource. Uh, of course, uh, we are serializing JSON and uh, in order to make this fit on a single screen. I've got the world's most ugly 
uh, string here with uh, some JSON. Everything has escaped because, of course, we've got quotes inside there. And obviously, this isn't using the new Java 14 multi line strings, which I've only just started playing with. Man, those things are cool. Uh, anyhow, we're uh, we're parsing this this JSON block. So once again, we create a fire context. Once again, we ask it for a parser, and then we call this parse resource um, method. And we say, I want to parse a patient object. Here's the string I want to put in. There are other options. Uh, the parse resource. There's a version that doesn't require you to tell it up front what uh, what type we're going to be parsing, and it will figure it out. There's a version that takes in a stream reader instead of just a, a string. So there's other options there if you don't have strings available to you. And then, of course, if you parse something, it's probably because you want to pull data out and do something with it. So in this example, we're going to pull out the identifier from this resource and get the identifiers system and value objects. And we're going to print those to the console. So when we run this, what happens? This is what we get out. Ooh, ah, not much there. Uh, one more thing I'm going to show before we get on to the exercise portion of the Let's Build. I'm going to quickly click on this link to take me to the Happy Fire website. Uh, and I do this just to, I, I like to point out, uh, this is, this of course is our website. A couple of things to say. Uh, I don't know if the, the animation on our, uh, our atlas actually showed itself over, over Zoom, probably not. But I will say if you're writing applications uh, using Happy and you'd like to be added to the atlas, we would love to have you. Uh, you can click on anything here, and there's some information about who's using it. If you want to put public contact information, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. Uh, so do please feel free to add yourself to this atlas. Um, and then most importantly, we've got all kinds of information about, uh, about the library and what's new. And really, the reason I came here is to show you this documentation link up at the top. I'm going to click on that for a second. Uh, this is our, our documentation. There is absolutely documentation on every aspect of the library. Uh, and I was talking before about how we're not gonna cover servers really today. Uh, if you're interested in getting started with servers, the thing I want to point out is in the navigation here, actually before I go there, I'll point out if you're interested in the history of Happy, uh, we've just split the table of contents out into different years. So you can actually see throughout the years, all of the changes that have gone through Happy Fire. Uh, there are many of them, so there we go. Uh, more importantly, though, if you want to try using the server, the thing I want to direct your attention to is this little lightning bolt. If you're interested in the plain server, you can click Get Started. Uh, and this will take you to GitHub links that take you to starter projects for, uh, for getting started with the plain server. If you're interested in the JPA server, which is the complete server in a box, you can click on the lightning bolt there. And that will give you a GitHub link to a project called the Happy Fire GPA Server Starter, which gives you a, a nice starting point for starting with either of these things. So loads of other documentation here. I don't nearly have time to go through it all today, but I will say very important to go through this. And if you end up with questions that don't get answered today and or maybe you know even this week and you at some point want to answer them, I will say this Get Help has a bunch of a uh, bunch of good places as well. And the most important one is, of course, our Google group, which I'll click on quickly just to say the Google group is super, super active. Uh, it has more or less constantly got people asking questions and is a great resource for anyone who's, who's trying to learn more about, uh, about Happy Fire. So with that said, I am going to get back to the slides. Our, oh, there we go. I missed an hour in one spot. Day one, that should say hour one, mapping your data to fire. Our exercise for today uh, is kind of a, a use case that we've seen a lot lately. So if you're building any kind of fire-based application, I mean, especially if you're working in the US, which I think most of our attendees at Dev Days US would be, uh, there's a decent chance that you are involved in the adoption of, of some of the, the, the great big IGs, uh, which are, are getting popular these days, many of which are around creating APIs for consumers. That is to say, APIs for patients or perhaps payer members, that type of thing. If you're doing that, one of the common problems you're going to want to solve is converting your data from whatever format it's already in into the FHIR standard and then uploading it to a server. So our exercise for today uh, is basically sort of taking an existing data set, which is in CSV, in comma separated value format, mapping it uh, to FHIR using the Happy FHIR model, and then uploading it to a server. And we'll be using the Happy FHIR testing server for this exact purpose. So this is, uh, this is kind of the, the, the short version of what we're going to be talking about today. 
we are going to be creating two resource types. And of course, you know, in order to keep the exercise manageable in scope, we're not nearly using all of the attributes. These are all of the attributes we're gonna fill out as a part of this. We're gonna give each patient an ID, we're gonna give them an identifier, a name and a gender. So it's the most bare bones patient you can imagine, but it is still a real patient example. And then we're gonna create observation resources. And those are lab test obser uh, observations, in fact, where we'll give them an ID, a code, a status, a subject. The subject, of course, is a reference over to the patient. And then a, a value, uh, and the value when you're dealing with lab tests is typically a quantity, which means it's got a system, a unit, and a value, uh, indicating, of course, what is the, the number for the lab test and what are its units. We are skipping a bunch of important fields. If you were doing this for real, you would probably be including observation.category to say what kind of thing this is. More importantly, if it's a lab test, you'd hopefully be including reference ranges and that type of thing, maybe even notes. Uh, we're not going to do those as a part of these exercises, but of course, you're welcome to add those things if you want. They are useful. We just wanted to keep the, the scope of what we're doing down a little bit. So this is the end of the slides for the first section, and oh, I'm totally on time, which is great. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I will come back to this one in just a moment so that you can, you can copy this URL down and get to this if you want. But first, I'm going to go to the GitHub page. Uh, if I click on that GitHub page, it takes me here. This is the uh, this is a repo that we have stood up specifically for this Let's Build section session. What I would do if you want to do the exercise later, I will say check this repo out. You can of course do that by clicking on the code button. Uh, and once you've checked it out, there is all kinds of information sort of taking you through what you should do. So. What we're doing is we are using a CSV file that is built into the repository. What we've done is there's this amazing uh, giant cache of openly available uh, data available through this program called CDC NHANES. Um, they've got just mountains of open source lab data. I mean, it's not entirely open source, but it is all freely available. It's all been de-identified, so, uh, you know, so you can't actually see who it is. And in fact, there's no identities in the data set, so I had to add some to make, uh, to make it seem a little bit more realistic, which I did. I added some fake identities to the data. Uh, also stripped out a bunch of the, the columns that were just too much for this exercise and trimmed it down so that instead of millions of rows, it's, it's only a thousand rows. But this is all realistic lab data because it is actual lab data from a set of patients. Um, there's a link here if you want to see the source data because there's way more of it than what we've included here. But I'm going to click on this link. Uh, this is our source data. As you can see, we've got a sequence number, we've got a timestamp, we've got an ID for a patient. Um, I've, I've added to this uh, as well. I've added a given name and a family name. And of course, this isn't letting me scroll properly. Um, oh, there we go. So on the right-hand side, we've got, um, we've got the gender and then we've got three lab test values as well. You, if you've ever dealt with lab tests, you probably recognize these columns, but if you don't, I'll tell you, they stand for white blood count, red blood count, and hemoglobin. Uh, and those three, uh, anyone who's worked with lab data will recognize as three of the initial, the initial types of uh, lab tests you would get when you had a complete blood count. Um, if you've ever seen a real complete blood count, it absolutely is not only going to have three tests per, per CBC. Um, but once again, I'm trying to keep the scope of what we're doing manageable. So I've strip, stripped out a bunch of the other numbers that you would normally get when you do a uh, complete blood count. Let's bring that back down so I can see where I am. So we are going to uh, we're going to check this out. Um, what we're going to be doing, and there's a description of what the columns are. To write a mapper, what you're ultimately going to be doing is um, you're going to check out this class right here, which is the the data. This is uh, a class called CSV Data Uploader. In fact, I've already got this checked out in in an ID, so I'm going to bring this up in here. Let's make that a little bit bigger. So what you'll see when you uh, when you open this up is this is a little skeleton for you to build from. Uh, I've imported a library called uh, actually I don't even remember what uh, what CSV library I imported. I think it's it's uh, oh Common CSV of course. So we've imported Common CSV. We're using that to parse. Uh, I've parsed out all of the values that are in that CSV, but it ends after I'm done with with the parsing and leaves the exercise to you to actually take that and map that into a fire patient resource as well as a collection of fire observation resources which you can then use to do your upload. Um, this is pretty much what the exercise is about. I'm going to run this class once just to show you. I mean it doesn't do much but 
if I run it, it does sort of go through and say I'm processing these rows. What you will do is you will add content to create uh, those resources and then you'll upload them to a server. Um, as a part of this, I have given, there's a couple of hint classes you can use if you want. The first hint, of course, gives you, here's what your, uh, what your fire resource might look like. So if you wanna figure that out, you might even consider not looking at the hints so that you don't need to, you don't need to do that, but you can. Uh, and then we've got a second one that actually starts creating the patient resource as well. So you can do that. And I will say, uh, if you want, if, if you really don't have time to do the whole exercise and you just want to see the solution itself, there is this class hint complete this goes through the entire solution, uh, including the second, the second hour stuff as well. So don't go, to, don't look through it before you get to Patrick's section, because then you're really jumping ahead, <laughs> or, or do I don't really care. Uh, if you want to see it though, this is a complete example, goes through, creates the, the fire resource and uploads it. So it is there if you, uh, if you want to look at it. So that is the exercise in a nutshell. I'm gonna take that back off the screen. I'm gonna go back to my slides put this guy back on the screen so that if you want to copy the, uh, the URL to the slides, you're welcome to. We are now gonna pause from now until, uh, well, 2 p.m. Eastern, what is 15 minutes from now, uh, but I'm gonna stick around. So if anyone wants to ask questions uh, and for the, the, the remainder of our first hour together, you're absolutely welcome to. Most of Dev Days, I will point out, uh, you are not able to unmute yourself. Uh, we use the, uh, the Whova Q&A function for questions and answers, but we do have this session uh, because it's a special format, let's build session, you are allowed to unmute yourself. So if you have questions, please feel absolutely free to unmute. And for that matter, if you want to uh, use this opportunity for a bio break or anything else, please feel free to do that as well. We will be picking up at the top of the hour. So James, while, while, while you've given your talk, we already had one question in the Q&A section regarding if you could use MySQL 8.0 as a backend database for the JPA starter server, which I already answered with yes, you can and pointed to the JPA starter project. And I'm hoping I gave the right, the right direction. <laughs> you did indeed, yeah, yeah. We, uh... So, I mean, I, I sort of briefly mentioned it, but I will, I'll say it again. We, uh, we use this library called Hibernate. Um, Hibernate is one of these things in Java that people either love or despise. There's many of people on both sides of that equation. Uh, we use a bunch of frameworks like that. We use Spring a bunch as well, which I know people <laughs> either love Spring or hate Spring. Uh, we actually, I mean, Hibernate, it does have its problems for sure. But one of the reasons we use it is because it really makes it a lot easier to, to support multiple versions and multiple platforms of databases. Um, we do test it regularly against a number of different uh, releases of different uh, different. So platforms. The ones that we test regularly uh, include Postgres. Um, and I, I mean, the oldest Postgres I know to still work is Postgres 7, but I've seen people using all the way up to 12. Um, and we've tested really all of the versions in between. Um, they all do tend to work well. MySQL is basically the same story. Um, everything right up to the most recent release of, uh, of MySQL works quite well with this. Uh, same story for SQL Server and, uh, and Oracle as well. Um, we do test against those four extensively. Uh, other platforms get less testing, but are known to work. Uh, we've seen people use Happy Fire successfully against MariaDB, including recent versions. Uh, Firebird DB certainly has, we've seen. There is a cache adapter for, for, ha for uh, Hibernate. I have heard of at least one person using that. I know there's a DB2 adapter that's gotten at least some usage. So certainly as far as databases go, I mean, you can use all kinds of different uh, platforms there with Happy. Thanks, James. And I just got another Q&A question, which is how to unmute. The unmute button doesn't work. Um, Jeremy, if you're listening, maybe you can jump in here. Yeah, sorry, I just made a change. Go ahead and try now to unmute if you don't mind. It. Um, it looks like uh, Artem. Artem is unmuted. Uh, Artem, did you have a question? Yeah. 
maybe not. Good to see you though, Artem. It's been a while. And there's another question from Chloe. Um, can you use Happy Fire without the Hypernate or without Hypernate? So I, I'm assuming without the Hypernate part or yeah. JPA, <laughs> whatever you call it, the magic. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so the two servers I talked about, the plain server and the JPA server, if you're using our JPA server, sure you're, you're pretty much yeah. stuck using uh, using Hypernate yeah, yeah. in that case, of course, uh, just because that that is the core piece of that that architecture. Um, yeah. Worth mentioning, I mean, we with Hibernate, you are allowed to roll your own queries, and we do a fair bit of that. We actually, uh, mid last year, rewrote all of the search capabilities so that it no longer uses Hi Hibernate just because we could do more efficient searching uh, without Hibernate. So that's what exactly what we did. Um, but you, all in all, you can't use the JPA layer without Hibernate. However, if you don't want to use Hibernate, that's fine. You can absolutely use the Happy Fire plane server. It does not use Hibernate in any way. Uh, it doesn't have Thanks. any kind of storage technology. Uh, and it's, it's, we've seen loads of people use it that way to, to add fire capabilities yeah, on top of all kinds of architectures. Hopefully that answers the uh, the question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? This is Artem. Ah, yes. Hello, Artem. How are you? Uh, hello, very well. Uh, how are you, James? Sorry, I was on uh, some, you know, had some microphone problem on my PC and I had to switch to my cell phone to, you know, to, to the dial here. Uh, sorry for the little bit of topic. Yeah, usually I have tons of questions for you, you know, because you are my expert in all this stuff. And each time I use this opportunity to ask. So my today's question is basically, are there any configuration features or any way to do it from the code as you has just shown? Uh, to solve the problem of uh, disabling particular uh, code sets in the Hypifier server. So the example is uh, when I load certain profiles like, uh, you know, carrying US score and it, it can be anything else. It can be just, you know, new newly created profile that says, okay, this is my structure of my, let's say, patient resource. I had certain cardinalities like mandatory fields and certain elements, blah, blah, blah. But also I want to introduce, let's say, some specific uh, code for like code, code system. Uh, I load code system in my definition package, right? Uh, that says this identifier or this, um, code, or this code should be out of this set uh, but due to some reason, I want to disable exactly this piece of functionality for verification against this code. I don't want to turn on the whole validation happy off. So I still kind of, it's, a, it's my debugging process because, you know, when I get like lots of errors, uh, cardinality mismatch, something like that, this, that, that, that code is incorrect, something like that. Really inconvenient. I want to kind of be able to say, hey, skip validation for only this coding system. Now turn it on back. I, I'm fine to restart the Happy Fire server or something like that. But is there any like this level of uh, granularity where I can manage uh, what happens within this validation? So not like just like on and off, but particular features. mute myself there we go yeah absolutely so i can uh, I, I mean i can even predict exactly why you're asking which is to say i obviously lots of people are implementing the uh the the big igs these days things like the karen blue button ig and those and of course a really common thing is for you to want to do validation where you're you're checking all of your your general semantics and your your structure and that type of thing against those igs but oftentimes the terminology can be challenging just because many of these igs import all kinds of crazy code systems that are actually really difficult pardon me to get into fire and oftentimes they're they're not even open code code systems they're they're proprietary things that have restrictive licensing so even getting a copy of those code systems is challenging uh, so a common a really common thing to want to do is to actually disable specific validation for specific code systems this is absolutely possible in happy fire there are a couple of things you can do so First off, the, the way that I would almost, you know, the, probably the easiest way to do this is to start by looking at, there's a, an interface in Happy Fire called iValidation Support. Uh, and iValidation Support is an interface that 
effectively is used to provide, among other things, fetching structure definitions, but it's also used to provide fetching code systems, to provide validation services, all of that kind of stuff. One of the things you can do, if you create your own implementation of iValidation support, you can create a version that is actually going to handle validation of a specific code system URL. Um, and you could use it, I mean, you know, if you wanted to write really basic validation where you're, you just, there's 10 codes you know are going to be there and you will just validate if you get those 10 codes. So you just do it all in code, that's possible. If you just plain don't want to validate the codes for that code system, you could just have it always return, return success as well for that specific code system URL, that's absolutely possible. Um, so effectively, the, the short answer to your question is I validation support, you'll want to create an implementation of that. Uh, and then add it to what's called the validation support chain. Um, and I, uh, I, I'm assuming you probably know what that is because if you use the validator, it's hard to get away from the validation chain. But mm -hmm. it is, if you haven't seen it before, it is a part of the internal mechanism. The only other thing I'll point out is there's a brand new interceptor. Of course, the answer in, in Happy Fire to everything is always interceptors these days. Uh, there's a new interceptor. It's it's so new that it's not even in our current 5.4 release, but it is committed and it'll be in our upcoming 5.5 release. It's called the Validation Message Suppressing Interceptor. And as you can guess from the name, you can use it to suppress any validation message you want. Uh, it uses regular expressions for that. Um, we did that as, as a matter of fact, because the current published version of US Core, uh, the pulse oximetry profile for US Core, um, this is fixed in the current pre like the, in the current uh, dev development build, but the current published build of US Core, it is literally not possible to create a, a, a resource that validates correctly against uh, the Pulse Ox profile because of a, a, an erroneous binding in there. So we created this, uh, this suppressing interceptor to deal with that type of thing. You can suppress any validation message you want using that, meaning it won't, uh, won't result in errors and can be, can be pulled out. So that, that thing can be incredibly useful to people. Oh, I thought I was sharing my screen, but I'm not. So resume that. I, I brought it up in my ID if you want to see the validation message suppressing interceptor. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's useful, actually. I'll take a screenshot just to investigate later. OK. Yeah, yeah that answers my question. Uh, can I ask more questions? <laughs> First, uh, I have, sorry. OK, <laughs> sure, sure, it. yeah. No, no, just I have an addition to this question. There's also even a new uh, 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 part for the validation chain, which you can set the validator to not throw errors if a code system is unknown. Ah, yes, this is true. Yeah, I was forgetting about that bit. Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. It's missing the value set part um, uh, still, but I, I will create an issue for that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, also a good point. Yeah, this is true. So I guess the uh, the other bit, just in case uh, in case that wasn't clear to you, uh, there is configuration now that you can use to tell the validator if if a code system is specified and that code system just cannot be found anywhere, that by default that's an error, but that can be softened to a warning, which sometimes is nice. Uh, how to configure that? Can you just give me a hint? I mean, don't need to reconfigure, but uh, just uh, w w which uh, file or class I need to use for to disable that. I'll read later about details, but just give me a hint. Uh, it's also in this validation message. I mean, if you just no. can remember how to. It's, so it's setting either on the DAO config object or the model config object. I'm just forgetting which. Oh, OK. It's OK. It's a DAO. OK, I, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I'll explore DAO. It's a DAO. OK. Uh, my second question is, uh, Again, uh, maybe maybe you will not. I mean, it's a question about IGs that are currently available, and I understand you're not working on them. But just I, I wanted to hear your opinion generally. You know, uh, there are IGs like US Core uh, that is basically um, it, it 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 derives from purifier rules, right? It doesn't. It, it, it none of the IGs go against purifier rules. This is a general concept. You you can't modify the general fire idea I, like use patient resources observation or some ridiculous stuff you cannot do this you, you can just introduce more strict rules on the resources uh and there is let's say carrying ig so in carrying ig uh, it's carrying blue button basically there is a statement that it's sort of inherited from uh us core by inherited i think that means that 
they took all mandatory fields from US core and added extra fields. So there is no case like field A on a resource A is uh, mandatory in US core and it's optional in uh, Karen. So basically say whatever is mandatory in US core, it's mandatory, but in addition to that, make, we may add more stricter rules. Like th th this is how I understand this inheritance, right? And the thing is, if you have data from like bundles, fire bundles from various type of sources, uh, you may have infrastructure like patient resource in your fire server is um, let's say a US core patient. And next you have a submission of the, let's say coverage resource that is designed in accordance with uh, current blue button but the requirement in this current blue button um, resource is that the reference must be not on US core patient, but on blue button patient. And, and this, this is a little bit weird because actually I don't know who has created my patient. It, it could have been created manually. It could have uh, came out of some uh, clinical data sources, you know, and basically I need to be capable of saying, hey, uh, this coverage resource uh, has a reference on the patient that's either blue button or US core because, you know, uh, and or somehow define this inheritance saying, yeah, actually US core is also sort of blue button. That's why this link on the patient designed by US core rules is fine. Uh, is there any way to configure that or, I mean, do you have any vision of how that's supposed to be? Maybe the IG is not fully correct. It, it, it seems like those IGs are fully isolated. I mean, though, there is a bunch of people working on caring and a bunch of people working on the score, and they don't think about, you know, getting various resources together, linking like having common resources like patient, practitioner, but some resources will intersect right out of these two IGs. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I, we're already getting into hour two, so I'm going to, I want to oh, hand things over sorry. to Patrick shortly. I'm going to say very briefly, it's, oh, it's absolutely okay. I mean, first off, this is, it's a really interesting topic. And of course, I mean, I know you already know about chat.fire.org. This is a super fun implementer chat type uh, conversation you might consider bringing over there. For what it's worth, I mean, the, it, it's true that these IGs tend to be developed in some, somewhat in isolation. The one good thing is they do tend to be cross compatible. I mean, it's, I find it's fairly rare that you've got a situation where you've got US core data and you've got Karen data. I, I'm not that it can't happen, but it's it seems less likely. These days, I mean, the most likely scenario is that you've got people doing DaVinci IGs and Karen IGs where both of those implementation guides implement, like they both extend from US core, but they extend in different ways. And the one thing that's good is they do tend to at least be compatible. So the one thing you can do is if your data is compatible with one of them, you can make it compatible with the other. Um, of course, you can't invent data where none exists, but at least the person who's authoring that data in the first place, it is totally possible to create data that supports both of those IGs. Um, that's, you know, if you're if you're dealing with payer data, that's probably the best thing you can possibly do is try and create data that's compatible with all of the IGs you need to support, because then you're in a in a good spot to reuse it across those use cases. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there just to uh, to let us move on to the next hour. But of course, um, we we can certainly talk about this more later, uh, or during the pub uh, pub event tomorrow, or I don't know. Okay, can, okay, sure, sure. Problems. Thank you, thank awesome. you. Anyway, it was really glad to see you again. For sure, okay. thank you, uh, Patrick. Do you do you want me to share, or do you want to share your uh, the second half of slides? I I will share the second half. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, it, while I'm starting this slide sharing, um, also coming from my side for the uh, the problem of incompatible or compatible profiles, the Java validator has some functionality with left and right options. I'm not sure if it's documented, but if you have a look at the code, there's some options to compare profiles. Um, so this could also be helpful to you. I'm not sure if it's working at the moment. I was there. I, I know there was some work on this. Um, I, I, I'm totally, to be honest, I don't know if it's working, but if it's working, it should be quite nice and, and probably something you, you're searching for. Um, and the second, no, now I have a question. Looking at the official agenda, we will start in 10 minutes, uh, but I think we just can continue. Yeah. Oh, did I have the tie? I thought I thought we started right at two. It's... 
I mean, I guess uh, I don't think anyone has left. So if you want to start now, I think that's fine. I will start now and we can, because doing questions before the presentation is hard. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. And how my browser is freezing. Okay, looking good. So hello everyone, um, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm doing the second part of this presentation together with James. Um, now we will have a look at how do we get these resources to a server or from a server? And we also will have a short look into validation. So um, we'll, we will see some of the validation stuff once again, which uh, James already started to talk about in a more deeper fashion probably. So the questions about creating resources, I think that was the, the part in between. And so I will skip over it for now. And we will have a look at the client. James already mentioned that we can get client from the fire context. The fire context is expensive. Don't, re, don't create a new one every time you're using a client. Um, creating a client is not as expensive. So um, this is uh, easier to recreate, but also you can reuse the client, especially if you're using it for the same server. Uh, you normally would reuse the client as well. Um, there are two flavors in Happy Fire how you can deal with the client part of Fire. So there's one annotation based uh, method to deal with this. Um, this is similar to JaxRS or Spring. It's not based on these, um, but it looks familiar if you have seen these frameworks or used these free frameworks before. So you basically just create interfaces like you, you do with Spring Boot a lot. And from these interfaces together with some annotations, the Happy li Library creates you uh, the client in which you can use how you would like to use this client. The alternative to this would be using the generic or fluent client. And this looks like creating the resources. You've seen this chained uh, uh, syntax before. So client.create.resource.pet.execute. So this is chained together. Um, the client has a create method, which then uh, uses uh, the resource pet. So the pet will be the actual patient you're trying to create against the server. And then you have to execute to execute the whole thing. Um, the generic and fluent client is in generic uh, or generally easier to use and, and, and therefore more popular. I'm a big fan of the generic and fluent client. I hardly even use the annotated client, but uh, I have colleagues uh, at the Institute where I'm working and they love the annotated client. So they are both ways and they, they both have their advantages. Um, so you're free to choose. So to create a patient, we already have, so, uh, have seen how the patient was created, whom Jim, uh, Homer J. Simpson was uh, uh, created as a Java object with the Happy Client uh, uh, library, but it was not communicated to any server. So in order to do this, we need a context, obviously. Um, with this context, we then create can create a client, but this client uh, needs to know with which server it shall communicate if we ask him to. So therefore we introduce some server-based URL, fire test uhnca slash base r4. This is the public happy uh, fire server. Um, and with this string, you then can get from the context a new generic client. Um, and this takes the server-based URL as an argument. And then you're ready to go. You have a client which is aware of which server it's uh, meant to communicate to. And as you, as you have seen in the uh, Fluent uh, slide before, on the Fluent side of the slide before, you then can do the dot create. I want to create a resource and this resource is this patient. And then you just type in execute. And then the happy client library will take care of all the parts like using the base URL, attaching the 
name of the um, of the resource in this case patient to the URL. This is done by the client already, so you're. Uh, uh, you don't have to deal with URL specialties here. There are also some uh, methods to, um, especially for search, I, I think it's very practical for search sometimes to, um, to set the URL string by yourself. So also this is uh, possible if you're interested in that, have a look at the Happy Fire documentation. There are examples for everything. And then if you do the create, afterwards you get a method, so-called method outcome. And this method outcome, you can just print it out, uh, the ID from the outcome um, of the newly created resources, uh, resource in that case, or you can investigate deeper uh, into the outcome if you really like to. The post and put um, you're doing in Fire, and this is, this is not specific to Happy, obviously. Uh, post and put, they can be conditional. Um, so this is a Fire feature. Um, because if you're using, no, if you're not using conditional posts, if you just create a resource against the server, this will always create a new resource as the server doesn't do any matching if this is a duplicate. It just will take your resource, put it on the server, assign a new ID on it. And therefore, if you do multiple post, uh, posts, you will create duplicates on the server. To avoid this, you can do puts like uh, updates. Uh, even for the first time. So Happy is also aware of the things like upserts, um, like it's written here, updates and or creates a resource uh, if you're using update against the server. Um, then you can provide an ID or your object, uh, which are putting already includes an ID, then the client will extract this ID and put uh, this um, resource against the correct re resource on the server. So using put instead of creates um, will avoid creating duplicates. You also can do this conditionally. So if you want to do conditional updates, you do a put with some search parameters. Um, so you don't update the resource against uh, slash patient slash one, you will update against the slash patient uh, question mark name equals uh, humor. Um, uh, no, Simpson, <laughs> as in the example before. If you want to have more information about that, here's the link to the conditional update spec inside of the fire specification about the rules, whether this conditional update will succeed or not. Um, if you're interested in that, have a look there. If you're interested in how to do it with Happy, uh, we will come to that, uh, to that later, or you have, can always have a look uh, at the documentation of the Happy library. Of course, the conditional is also conditionality is also a possible when you're doing creates, you're posting, and then you're posting with a search parameter. Um, and this will only create a resource if it's not already existing on the server. So this also avoids duplicates um, if you like uh, to avoid them. So easiest in general is to do the update because it will update and or create the resource. Um, but if you just want to create or you have a server endpoint which only accepts posts and not, not puts, um, then it's uh, good to do the conditional create, which is basically the same as you're searching manually on the server. Is this observation or this patient all already existing? Um, and if not, then posting it. So looking at the code, how to do an update, a client side assigned ID create. So this is some, 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 some people call it absurd. Um, so the patient, new patient, we have seen that before. We then have the population of the patient object, like uh, the, not the identifying the name, but the, the gender and then contact details. And um, for this example, we need the identifier and the name. So this is written out here. So this is part of the our one exercise um, to add identifiers and names. And then if you have a patient object with an identifier and some name, then you can set the ID um, because we want to do a client side assigned uh, ID create. So we already knowing the ID of these objects because we are getting these in this exercise from a CSV file, which already has um, 
the IDs inside of it. Um, and this is, uh, if you're thinking about ETL pipelines, this could be a common use case. I, I just had somebody talking to me about this use case. Um, and then you can set the ID um, to patient slash one, two, three, and then you can invoke the server method, um, client.update, not create this time, update, dot resource. We want to update the patient to the server and execute. So almost the same, but we're using update and we need to have the ID element populated. The method outcome then will contain information about the response from the server, including the ID, uh, the operation outcome response, status code, et cetera. Um, so to get the ID, we've seen this one before, outcome get ID and, oops, um, then we can just system out print line the ID to check whether uh, which, no, to check which ID the server assigned because if you don't know the ID, um, you could search with the name uh, or and the identifier, but otherwise you, you, have, you have to search uh, first. So it's always good to keep track, a uh, good idea to keep track of your ID if you want to do something else with the resource later. To um, create a, a patient conditionally, we can have multiple forms. So the, the first form here is the uh, client create resource patient. So this is the same patient as before. Um, the uh, ID will be ignored if we are create, doing a create a post against the server. Um, but here comes the conditionality part of the whole request. And there we can have the conditional by URL, which takes uh, the URL string. This is uh, one of the functionalities I mentioned before. Sometimes it's just easier if you already know the search string or the conditional string in this case, just type it in and you're good to go. Execute, same as before. But you also can do it in a more object oriented, more happy supported way. Um, you can use dot conditional instead of conditional by URL. So this is similar to this type things where you have string and string type, conditional by L or conditional pure. And then you can add the where clause uh, via the objects of the happy fire library. So where patient dot identifier dot exactly is exactly dot system and identifier. And then system identifier uh, takes two arguments, the system of this identifier. So the system identifier SID system identifier, yeah. And the uh, actual code, the actual value of this uh, identity or identifier of this patient. The outcome get created then will return true if the server responds with HTTP as 201, which means created. Uh, otherwise it will return null and then you have the feedback from the server that this was already on the server and wasn't created. Uh, for the first time on, onto this server. And then if you want to know the ID uh, of the created or the pre-existing resource, you can get the ID from the outcome. Notice here, even if the patient doesn't have an ID here, after uh, doing the uh, uh, create conditional create against this, um, you will have an ID because the server as always assigns IDs uh, with uh, during the create um, operation. So coming from how to create, how to update, how to conditionally create, um, going over to the transaction bundles. Transaction bundles are very powerful uh, for fire beginners, maybe a little bit confusing at first, but this, uh, what makes transaction bundles so uh, powerful is that you can have multi multiple interactions with the server bundled together in one, bundle in one trans in the transaction bundle. And in these transaction bundles, you can have even temporary IDs and the server then will replace these temporary placeholder IDs with the appropriate IDs when posting this transaction bundle against the server. So now we're looking at this example here. We need a bundle, it's called transaction bundle. So first we start with a bundle and we have to set the type of this bundle to uh, bundle bundle type transaction. Then we need to add the, the different entries to the bundle. This is done via bundle.addEntry. 
we then have to set the full URL of this um, resource. And the full URL is basically, if it's an already persisted resource, the, the full FQDN full URL to this uh, resource. If it's not already persisted, um, as I mentioned before, this could be some temporary ID. So in this case, the patient already has an ID, uh, therefore we can set the full URL to patient get ID element get value, which will be a, a relative uh, path, which is okay for now, but I, I saw that Lloyd was mentioning this will be illegal in R5. In R5, full URLs always are meant to be full URLs. I think there will be some discussion on that, but just to be aware about this possible change in the future. Um, so we're setting the URL of the entry, and now we are setting the actual resource of the entry. And the resource is, of course, the same patient as before. Uh, we are then setting the request of this bundle entry, but um, we are using this convenient get request method for it. The get methods in Harpy are null proof. So they never return null. They will always return some empty object, some empty list, which you then can deal with uh, with the uh, Fluent API with some chain, permit, uh, chain methods later. So we use the get request to get an empty request object. We are setting the URL of the request to patient because we are dealing with a patient. And we are setting the if none exists to identifier equals, and it's the identifier of the patient. Um, and we are setting the, the method to uh, post basically. So this is also a conditional create but made differently inside of a transaction bundle. In inside, inside of the transaction bundle, we're using the request part. We're setting the URL. We're setting a set if none exists, which is self-explanatory. Um, we only want to create this uh, if it's not already existing this a patient with this identifier. And then, of course, we can add multiple, multiple other entries. So for your example, you could add uh, one transaction bundle for one patient, including all its observation. Or you could decide to go with five patients with all uh, their observations in one transaction bundle. But no, most of the time, you, in, in, in such a scenario, you would have one transaction bundle per patient, and including the patient and all its observations. So to, to handle that, the client has another method, which is, which is called transaction we can choose to have the transaction with a bundle and we, have, we put in the bundle we created before here and execute as always. And then we have a response bundle uh, as, the, uh, as the outcome of this uh, execution. And then if you want to lock the response, um, we can do basically some system out print time. You can do some logging in, in your, of course, in your advanced uh, uh, code. But for now, we just do a system out print line. We will get a new JSON parser. So this is kind of new. We can get a parser from the context. And then as James already mentioned before, we set pretty print to true because we want to have a look at it if we're system do, doing system out print line and therefore um, having indentations and new lines is, is a good thing. And then dot encode resource to string. So we are taking the bundle response and system out print line, the response. We also could take the patient and uh, encode it to a resource. Same code because this just takes every kind of fire resource. Okay, so recap. Transaction bundle sends all your resources in a single transaction. So this is like a proper transaction. If some request will fail inside of this transaction, there will be a rollback on the server and everything is like it was before. So this is a huge advantage over doing it individually and dealing with the rollback manually. Um, if you don't want to have this rollback, you can go with a, a batch bundle, which is the same, but without the, uh, uh, the transaction scope. Um, the new resources will get a temporary UUID um, to be able to reference resources inside the transaction bundle. Um, yes. If, if you choose to, if, you're, if you want to do client-side uh, client assigned IDs, 
uh, then you can go with, with proper IDs or if you're do, dealing with some parts of the resources, they already have the location on the server, then you would go with the normal IDs and the normal full URLs, but it's also possible to use temporary UUIDs and that's very, very powerful. So that's the short introduction to the client. I will now show you some more slides about validation because validation, at least in my experience, gets more and more important uh, at, at the moment for a long time. But <laughs> recently I got contacted by, by many, many implementers in Germany. They have the problem implementing implementation guides like it's the same everywhere <laughs> worldwide. But uh, Germany was probably a bit, little bit late, but now we have the first like bigger IGs which have to be implemented on the national level. And people are always afraid of are my resources valid against this ID? And therefore they want to validate um, their resources. The easiest thing uh, would be you have already a fire server uh, available, which is uh, aware of all the resources and also profiles you're using. If you're using a JPA starter server, uh, the JPA starter server had uh, a recent, or not, not very recent, but <laughs> recent addition to it to, to uh, ingest fire packages. So you can have a JPA starter server spinning up and already primed with an IG basically. And then you can use in your client, um, the uh, base role of the server slash resource type for example, patient slash dollar validate and the body you put into the, the resource as you would post this resource against the server. And then you would get a method outcome uh, answering you if this is a valid resource or if there are some validation issues uh, containing it. With Happy, this is very easy to do. Um, so the say almost the same like creating a resource, but instead of creating, we are validating the resource. Um, against the same server because the service inside of the client, uh, it's a parameter of the client. So you could decide to first validate the resource and then uh, create the resource on the server to, to make sure uh, to have only uh, valid resources on the server. Of course, the more professional approach would be the server rejecting non-valid resources, which can be done nicely with Happy Fire, but, but won't be covered uh, by this um, hands-on part. So one important question is when and how to validate. Do I need to validate everything? When I was quite new to Fire, a lot of people talked, I talked to, I think Graham was one of them. Uh, it told me, oh, you crazy Germans. You also, you always want to be so correct and want to validate everything. Uh, because at the same time, obviously most of the uh, US implementers, they were not caring about validating, not at least not validating that deep. Um, so there's not one right question to the answer whether you should validate, validate every time, everything. Um, you could validate very strict during development, but be quite loose in production. Um, so this is an approach several people, uh, uh, customers of mine have used. Um, you could choose to validate some resource types, but not others. Um, you could choose to validate on the way in, but not in the way out, or only in the way out, not in the way in. This depends also on your use case, whether you you want to make sure that your server is always complying to a prof profile, then you could validate it on the way out. Uh, to be honest, I've never done that before. Uh, and you could uh, ask yourself if you use structural or semantic validation. So of course, for the semantic validation, there's some performance costs. And the validation happy fire um, can be done on various uh, 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 levels. So these are two of them. The, the one of the simplest validation is the parser. Um, the parser can be configured with error handlers, which locks or fails an error. Um, the parser, even if you don't have a strict error handler, if the parser can't match your string to the object or vice versa, there will be some exceptions. So parsing is uh, is some kind of structural validation only catches structural issues of course and then we have the proper validators um, like the semantic validation this applies a complete set of rules to a resource instance like 
value set bindings, cardinalities, um, uh, uh, invariance, um, all of these things will be applied against the instance of a resource by the help of the profile, which is inside, uh, which has to be inside of the validator that he can make such um, claims against the instance. So this is not only currently, I always smile when I read this, currently far more powerful. I think this will be forever more, far more be powerful, um, but it has some cost impact. Yeah. So having a quick look and how to do the parser error handling or how to modify it. So we here we have a very uh, simple uh, resource type patient foobar example here. Um, we are using our fire context as before we are getting our parser from the context and then we can set parse error handler and we can use a new strict error handler also part of the happy file library um, to to give uh, even more strict error on these uh, uh, um, parsings and then you could use this to parse the resource your input string and then you will end up with an ibase resource which then can be cast to your appropriate resource you want to use, in this case, a patient. Yeah, this was just a small glimpse on the parser uh, error handler. Now we're switching over to the way more interesting part, or to the more interesting part, at least to me, uh, the validation module. So we've seen you could use the client to throw it against the server to get, get it validated by a server. But if you don't have a server or do you, you don't want to contact this outside server to validate against, because uh, for example, for privacy reasons, um, um, you want to keep everything in house and don't have a second server, then you can use the Happy validator modules. Of course, the Happy server itself also uses these validator modules. Um, and of course, this was mentioned before by James in the break um, during the question Q and A time, you can create your own validation modules if you want to. So basically this looks something like this. We have our inputs, our outputs. Um, so the inputs could be a Java model, but it also could be a raw JSON or XML resource. The outputs are a, a plain Boolean, true, false, pass, fail. Um, we can get a list of issues like info warning or errors. Um, and you can have a look at, at the operation outcome itself um, as well. Um, the profile validation uh, is done uh, through the happy validator through its mode uh, uh, modules. In fire profile is a collection of special resources. Um, I like this uh, sentence, um, but if you're very precise, a profile is only a structure definition, but a structure definition uses value sets and code systems. So if you don't have these value sets and code systems inside of your validator available, you can't validate. So therefore a profile uh, is a collection of special resources. Um, a resource itself, the instance can then declare conformance to a profile in its metadata um, and the server can require also a conformance to a profile. So this is a slight uh, difference, but a very important one. If you have a server and you want, you want to validate everything which is coming in uh, and you are only relying on the customer, for example, or to the client uh, that the metadata profile is filled out correctly, then this can be done like this. But of course, uh, a client can lie and declare some different conformances uh, in its profile um, and then this can fail, of course, if you're aware of the profiles, but just to keep in mind, um, the conformance of the instance is just some declaration of the instance. So, so be sure to double check it. Uh, and also servers can require conformance to profiles, even global uh, um, requirements. So for example, let's say my server only accepts US core patients uh, independently from your use case. Also, this can be done. The validation support modules um, are uh, bound together through a support chain, as you can see here. So 
we have several different modules which are already coming with Harpy with the Harpy library um, and the Fire Instance validator, which is the the validator uh, you later then will use to validate against, requires an instance of I validation support, which could be a caching validation support, encapsulating everything below this, so caching the whole chain, or you can have one implementation without cache and just have the, the chain here, or you can even just have some uh, individual modules here uh, linked to define instance validator. Uh, but helpful, there are some uh, side effects to this. So um, if you don't have an in-memory terminology server validation support, you can't do terminology server validation, even if you have default, pro default profile validation support already providing all needed profiles and value sets in order to execute them, we need uh, this one. So um, to dig deeper into this, have a look at the documentation of Harpy. They are very well uh, uh, drafted examples for this to, to have different use cases on how to uh, combine these validation and support modules together. So um, we already saw these ones before. Um, so the validation support chain just change multiple providers together. Uh, we have the default profile validation support. So this uses the built-in fire definitions and terminologies like pro, patient, observation, uh, the value sets, code systems defined in fire, the extensions. Um, you can extend this by having a pre-populated validation support module, which takes your own structure definitions, code systems and value sets, um, and is then able to validate even these. And then there's the in-memory terminology server uh, validation support, which is needed that the validation validator can do um, val terminology validation in memory. Otherwise, you would you you would have to use an external term terminology server validation support, which is also a great idea, uh, especially if you're do dealing with really big terminologies. Um, I myself recently uh, switched over to having an external terminology server validation support to uh, not um, fill the server, which is primarily there for the for the data of the patients and the observations and so on, to fill it with megabytes or gigabytes of terminology stuff and blow the server up. So therefore we are reusing one uh, central terminology server, which is also in Happy server uh, at the moment right now. So gluing this together looks something like this. We have the uh, fire validator. So we are asking the context for a new validator. There we have the validator. And um, here we have some uh, modules. Um, so we want to have a new fire instance validator. And then we register this validator module against this fire validator as above. Um, we then uh, have a, a resource here um, and we pass it to the validator with the validator dot validate with result and we give it uh, the resource uh, and we will end up with a validation result object. Um, and then down here, I will skip this part, um, we can iterate over these validation messages and just do some system or print lines to uh, get the message, get the location string. So this is uh, uh, where the uh, where in the resource the the, the, the problem was. So uh, column and, and line. And this is everything you need to do to have uh, some easy instance validator thing. Um, I'm now switching over to the more advanced stuff or to how to use the validation support chain. Also, this, as you can see, is from the Fire Happy documentation. So uh, feel free to have a look there as well. So now we are building a, a validation support chain first. And this validation support chain takes as arguments all the, F, the, the other uh, validation modules. And as we saw in the uh, UML-like UML -like graph before, we're using the same ones. No, not the same ones, actually. We're using the default profile validation support for all the um, resources contained in the fire spec already. 
Then we have the in-memory terminology server validation support for dealing with terminology validation. And we're also adding common code system terminology service, which adds some common code systems like a UCOM validation, which is grammar. So it's great to have this here now to be able to validate UCOM as well. You then have your validator like before context, new validator. Um, and then you have the fire instance validator, the new fire instance validator, but this fire instance validator now takes the modules here uh, as an argument. So this instance validator uses a whole support chain. If you don't provide anything, it will be using just this, uh, the schema files. And then you register your validator module, the instance validator from here against your validator from before here. And then of course you can have some settings on these validators. Uh, for example, set any extensions allowed. This means that uh, you won't get an error if there's an unknown extension contained in an instance, which is validated. Um, if you disallow this, you will get some errors if you're using extensions, which are not known to this validation stack. So for the validation, this is the same. We have an observation. Uh, we're using validation with results. We are then system out print lining from the validation result object we are getting from the validate with result method. Um, result is successful. And then we get a false or true. And in order to uh, show the issues, you can iterate over the result get messages, which is a list of single validation messages. And then you can have a nice uh, system or print line or nice handling of the validation outcome in your own code. Okay, and now let's build. So of course, uh, looking at the time, um, we can do the whole uh, live coding approach uh, this time, um, but I will, guide you through the classes which are included inside of our, let me make that kind of full screen a little bit bigger. So spoiler alerts, this is not our two. So this, the, the, the classes are still named day two. I, I fixed everything in the slides while James were uh, giving his speech. Um, but the day two start is basically the after day one. So the solution for um, creating all the, um, all the um, objects, uh, the Java objects with the happy library from the CSV file. And there, here are some to do's added. So the first one would be that you have to create your own context and client with a server base URL of your choice. This is the public happy fire base URL. So feel free to, to use this one. If you have your own, use your own. And then in order to get a better understanding on what is happening uh, while communicating with the server, you could then register a locking interceptor to the client. Um, and now we're skipping over the, basically over the solution of the first part of this hands-on. Uh, let's build, sorry. And then there's the next to do. After this, we will end up having obviously a patient. And now we are using the client um, to do a client assigned ID create here. Then we are switching over to these different observations, skipping over the uh, creation part here, upload the observation using a client, client assigned ID create. Um, the good thing, uh, no, not the good thing, <laughs> of course, in the solution, but if you're implementing the first part, make sure that you do the referencing probably. So this is some hint for you already, some spoiler, um, set the subject on the observation. Otherwise the two won't be connected to each other. Next white black count, upload, upload. So this would be the first part of uh, the implementation of how to create uh, using client assigned IDs, um, create resources with client assigned IDs. 
I then also included some more hint files. Um, this one is uh, basically the solution. Um, the first one is using just the client um, doing conditional updates um, with uh, the client's assigned ID. The second one, day two hint two is the same thing, but using a transaction, a transaction bundle. And the day two hint three uh, is then the next one. So this contains uh, the solution of the first part, but now the to do is not uh, create or send the resource to the server, it's validate the resource. So at every position, there's a resource, there's the three observations and the patient uh, use uh, or use uh, the client to validate the uh, for observations and the patient. And I already created the stop for the validate um, method because obviously you want to reuse your code here. And therefore I have already created the static validation uh, stop here. You could solve this with two options. And that's why I also added the validate with client complete and with happy validation classes. The client complete just uses, as shown before, the client, oops, the client dot, make this a little bit bigger, sorry. Uh, the validate. So the to do is obsolete here. <laughs> validate client patient. And if you scroll down, there's some validation method already, which should use at some point here, the client.validate resource against the server. The second solution or hint um, is the same thing, but now we're using, as you can see, the validation method is um, much bigger. We are now not using a, a server anymore to validate against. We are now using our, our own um, support chain to uh, validate our um, our um, resources against. So these are the uh, the exercises. Um, I recommend you to start with day one, um, doing all the stuff James mentioned in the first part of this talk. Um, or of this uh, let's build track and uh, then just go down to day two, try to do your own implementations on the client interactions. First the easy one with single interactions, then with the transaction bundle. And then, then you can have a look at the solution of course, or if you get stuck as well. And then you can from the creation go over to the validation of your resources and you also do uh, solutions are included in the GitHub repository. And if you have further questions, feel free to ask in the Google group, as James mentioned, I know the Google group is much more frequented or, or, or there are more people using actively the, the Google group. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Sulip chat, fire chat. Um, there's also a happy fire chat uh, stream there, but um, yeah. I prefer Sulit, but I even I have to say that the Google group is probably the place where you get a faster response. Um, yes, so that's it for the exercise of my part. I think we should or could use the last minutes now to have some open questions, um, whether it was against. So we will know, we will start with questions for part two. And if we don't have specific part, uh, questions for part two or hour two, then we can switch over to use the last minutes for some open questioning rounds. So I try to look at the QA. In which Java package Java file, the file instance validator is accessible? Yeah, that's a very good question. Let's look at the Maven dependencies of this project. So this is in something called validation. Uh, I 
can't find it. I maybe have to double check my solution, but it was working before. Um, validation package happy. Yeah. So as you can see, there is the happy fire validation package. Um, this includes all the um, classes which are used for the validation chain and so on. Um, if you want to use um, validation resources, there are also uh, validation resources. So these are the resources to validate against. The validate resources uh, right here. So happy fire validation and happy fire validation resources are for, of course, the validation resources dependency is uh, dependent on the language level of fire you're using, whether it would be R4, R5, DSU3, and so on. Any further questions? I hope the people are able to unmute themselves. If you don't have a microphone, feel free to use the Hoover chat. Hello. Uh, yeah, this, hi. This is Artem again. Sorry for getting in, in all this bro broadcasting. I have too many questions as usual. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I, I might have missed that. Is it possible to validate the whole bundle? So is there an endpoint? Is it like base um, dollar sign validate? If uh, before loading the bundle, I just want to make sure it's structurally correct and all profile references are in there. Can I just validate the whole bundle? Of, yeah, of course. Um, you could validate the whole bundle. Um, so, sorry, my Chrome is freezing up at the moment. So the, the validate, um, validate with resolve and takes a, an I base resource um, as an argument, um, which is basically every fire resource. And as a bundle is also a, a valid fire resource, you can validate uh, your bundle against the validator directly. Um, you can also have a profile on the bundle um, to make some uh, assumptions or some rules about the structure of the bundle. But I'm feeling you, you, you were asking about not having a profile bundle, but having entries inside of the bundle which have profile annotation and then yeah yeah. yeah 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 i'm mostly talking about you know uh the bundle that is, um, may contain uh, multiple resources each resources uh, with profile annotation and so basically it's kind of like a uh a, a final package uh to be delivered in the fire server with all proper links and stuff like that but before that i just want to make sure that it's structurally correct because the original yeah. bundle can be you know some someone else's sources and stuff like that yeah. so before pushing i just want to validate yeah exactly so this is one of the use cases you want to make sure you don't pollute your server with not valid or un wrongly structured data um so um, in order to do this, you, you just validate the bundle. Um, if you don't have a profile bundle, it doesn't matter. Then the, the bundle will be checked if it's a valid bundle against the, the base specification. Um, but the entries inside of the bundle, they should be validated against the correct uh, profiles. I'm asking James if he could add something because I'm not 100% sure about this. I was, there was some option in the Java validator, but, um, oh yeah, James is still there. Thank you, James. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, uh, yeah. To be honest, I, I mean, I'm reasonably certain that if you post a bundle and it's full of resources and those resources have different profile declarations, I am reasonably certain that it will, uh, it will validate each individual resource in the bundle, including against the profiles that those individual bundles declare. But I will be honest, I'm not 100% sure that that's true. Um, that would need some testing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, no, we're, anyway, we're on okay, the same okay. page. <laughs> okay, no, okay, I, I can try myself, but the whole idea is that it's basically for that, yeah, because uh, I, I usually, personally, I usually don't send resources individually because I have certain context, you know, 
yeah. and transactional bundles uh, for me is uh, just a brilliant way to do that. It's really convenient. It 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 helps to you know handle these references and and that's why I want to pre-validate the whole bundle of a transaction type. So I, I, okay, I, I got the idea. Thank you. Yeah, but be careful with transaction bundles. Um, so if this is coming from somebody else. Um, we, we also use in uh, transaction bundles at the Mullet Institute very heavily uh, for getting diagnostic reports from genomic labs, including hundreds of variant observations and stuff like that. It's faster and easier with transaction bundles. Um, mm -hmm. But in a transaction bundle, you could do basically everything. So if you don't have protection on your server, you could create a transaction bundle deleting your whole server. Yeah, yeah, of course. Modifying this, uh, your resources. Yeah, they, I, I mean that usually the approach, for instance, I use, it's basically I declare that I can consume collection type of bundle from someone else. So in this case, I don't need to worry about the data content, like, uh, you know, observation codes and whatever is inside the resources. So it's just a pure data. <clears throat> and when I get on my endpoint, this collection type of bundle, I kind of convert it into transaction type of bundle myself. And this yeah, gives me yeah. this level of, you know, control over the resources, what I'm getting. So I won't delete anything. I, I'll just, you know, I may ex add extra identifiers on this data just for myself for tracking, even though the data itself remains as is, I, as I get it. Yeah, of course, this is not the really good way to open and point like for delete, uh, because a transaction bundle supports searchable deletes you can put delete and search yeah. query and it will wipe out like you know hundreds of resources you just lose everything yeah i understand that that's why it i mentioned sense. it yeah mm. okay any other questions so along those lines of the validation um when you're dealing with a larger flow of data say i'm essentially backloading backloading a, a server with three years of patient information. Is it probably more prudent to build that validation to the pipeline instead of at the server level to reduce kind of those calls back and forth to the server? Yes, uh, I, I would absolutely agree. Um, so if you have like mass data, um, and you want you have some pipeline at the end. You will persist it. You you want to persist it on your server. Uh, your server will be under heavy load already, just uh, digesting all the new resources, um, and and you don't want to add extra work like validation on top of it. So in in some massive, big massive data uh, use case like three years of patient data, I would always go with. Uh, pre-validating before the, the rest interaction to the server. And therefore you could uh, unload the, the, the load for the validation from the server to, to another server or, or some work, wherever your pipeline is running at um, and, and your server should be faster. There are also, um, if you're handling uh, uh, many, many records, um, also keep an eye on um, performance optimizations for the happy server. So for example, if you have uh, the, like in our example, you, you already know the ID of the patient and on the, of the observation and so on, then you can do conditional updates and even uh, disable the check in the server if this ID is already taken. So this is very dangerous, but this improves performance significantly if you want to load a lot of data to a server. And um, also as a side note, there's also bulk data uh, in a fire. Um, bulk import is not implemented in the happy fire yet, if I'm correct. Uh, bulk export is already there. So also uh, uh, if you're dealing with huge amounts of data, bulk fire bulk data is a, a good way of dealing with the huge amounts of data. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So going to the last minute, uh, one final question. Okay, I'll take the, this one. <laughs> uh, start time again. Uh, if we use, just one more question here. So basically, if we try to uh, do a front-end validation, I mean, using like a library first, not actual fire server. So to, to separate those things. So I do validation of my bundle first, 
and if it's okay, I load it next. But the only thing it seems to be missing is that I can't be 100% sure about the links, right? So if I have a bundle like patient and observation, and this observation refers practitioner, for instance, and practitioner is not in my bundle. So basically running validator will give me like you have a broken link in the bundle. Right, because it doesn't know yeah. anything. I'm, I'm talking about transaction type of bundles. Even yeah, though yeah. this practitioner might exist actually in Fire Server, and if I do actual post, it may say, "Hey, the, you you are specifying the proper ID on the observation, and I I have this practitioner, and now this bundle is fine because there is a context." Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're correct on this one. I'm not sure. I don't think you can switch it off in the validator to check referential integrity. Um, uh, Patrick, sorry to interrupt, but we are out of time for this session. So we yes. might have to take the answer offline. Yeah, feel free to ask us on Sulip Google Groups. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So have a great Dev Days. See you. I can, can I